So good evening, my name is David Tricky. I'm a clinical psychologist and I'm also co-director of the UK Trauma Council. Thank you so much for joining us uh, in this webinar this evening. You're very, very welcome. We are going to be thinking about childhood trauma, war and conflict. And I'm really pleased to say we have some true experts sharing their knowledge and experience with us this evening so that we can think about what can be done to help to reduce the impact of war and conflict on children, young people and their families. I would just like to share a few slides, if I may, just to tell you a little bit about the UK Trauma Council. But before I do that, just a bit of housekeeping, really. Uh, so the way we're going to run this webinar is we'll keep people's videos and microphones turned off. If you have any technical questions, please use the Q&A and one of our amazing events team will be able to help you out. If it's helpful, you can have closed captions. We'll be operating Zoom. You just click on the button at the bottom of your screen and you should have um, closed captions, subtitles coming up. We're going to record the webinar presentations uh, so that they're available after today, but we're not going to record the Q&A. We just wanted to make sure people feel um, that they don't feel that added pressure of um, having their questions or their answers being recorded. And just to say, you know, we're going to be thinking about children and trauma, and it's right that we should be moved by thinking about such things. But if for whatever reason this evening your feelings are stronger than you're happy with, please do do what you need to do to look after yourself. That might mean you need to step back for a bit and then come back and join us. It might mean that now isn't the right time to be thinking about this and you can watch the recording on another day. It might mean you need to reach out to friends or colleagues um, or you can access other sources of support. One such source of support would be the Anna Freud Crisis Messenger. If you go to the Anna Freud website, you'll find that very easily. So let me tell you a little bit about the UK Trauma Council. It's a project where we try to help those around children and young people that have experienced traumatic events to try and reduce the impact. So we very much focus on the young people and the children, but we do that by helping those around them, such as social workers, foster carers, therapists, teachers. We also try and help policymakers to make sensible evidence-based decisions, but mainly we are producing free and accessible resources and guidance. We don't just make these ideas up, we very much draw on the research evidence available. We work very closely with our intended audience, so if we're writing something for teachers, we'll work very closely with groups of teachers to try and make sure that what we're doing is useful. We have a group of child trauma experts from around the UK from different professional backgrounds, um, so we very much draw on their expertise. And we have a youth advisory board made up of young people with experience of trauma themselves. So that's how we go about doing what we do. Um, we have various research and practice resources, including videos to explain some things to those of us working with children and young people. We also have regular research roundups where we try to bring the research together that's been published to try and understand particular areas. Um, one of them is on racism, mental health and trauma. That might be of interest to some of you. And we also have a research roundup on developmental trauma disorder. You know, what does the evidence actually tell us about this as a concept? And then we have various resources. Um, one set of resources on childhood trauma, the brain and the social world, really helping people to understand what is the impact on children and young people's brains of traumatic experiences? How do their brains adapt to their experiences and what problems might that cause but also really importantly what can we do to try and reduce that impact we have resources on traumatic bereavement aimed at both schools and also clinicians working in this area we have some resources on childhood trauma and ptsd some animations made with and for young people explaining what ptsd and what they might do about it and what therapy might be like um, and we also have some training videos there for those people doing cognitive therapy for ptsd we have a set of resources aimed very clearly at schools and communities and early year settings around critical incidents. What can they do to create the environment for recovery? And very recently, just a week or so ago, we released our resources on childhood trauma, war, migration and asylum. And these resources consist of a couple of toolkits, one aimed very much at educational communities, just to help them think about how they can help young people who have been affected by war and conflict, migration. How can they recognize difficulties and how can they respond to trauma? And also 
resources aimed at community organizations and they would include a plan for running a workshop with young people so a lot of the organizations we partnered up with are brilliant at supporting young people helping them to access education to get housing to get benefits all those sorts of things and to offer social support really important but when it comes to talking and thinking about their mental health they just needed a bit more of a guide so that's uh, what can be found there um, there's also a self-help guide for young people which is available in several different languages and an animation rather aimed at those around the young people the animation is very much aimed directly at young people themselves so it's to help them to stop and think about how their experiences may have affected them and what might they be able to do about it and one of my colleagues i'm sure will be putting the link for that animation into the q a so you can follow that up later on if you want to okay so that's just a very quick whistle stop tour of the UK Trauma Council for you. But what I'd like to do now is introduce you all to Dr. Shoshana Lyons, who is the clinical director and founder of Beacon House, which is a specialist therapeutic service. Now, many of us will know of Beacon House through its fantastic resources that are available. Um, and I think most of us in this field would be using their resources at some point in our work. And Shoshana is going to talk to us about how to talk to children about war and conflict in countries away from um, countries away from the conflict, particularly when families or friends uh, may be at risk. So I'll hand over to Shoshana now. Thank you, David. Thank you for that introduction. Um, so the context that um, I'm talking to you all from is as a service at Beacon House, we, um, we work with many, many children and families who themselves are struggling with mental health uh, difficulties and trauma. And what we are seeing is that the images, the ideas, the, um, the knowledge that children have about what's happening in the world out there really takes its toll on many, many children. And so, as David said, what we're going to think about together um, for the next 20 minutes or so is how we can support children who are affected by what they're seeing and what they're hearing on the news. So the, uh, the ideas that we're going to think about today are really for any adults supporting children. So this might be for you as parents or carers or teachers, professionals, extended family. Really, this is for any of us supporting children in the UK who are affected or potentially affected by what they are seeing and hearing. We're going to think about how we might spot the signs of distress. So in many ways, I'm building on what we've just heard from the previous speaker. Um, and we're going to look at signs of over distress. They're the, the easier ones to spot. And we're also going to look at some signs of distress that can often go under the radar. So what might they look like? And then we're going to get really practical. So I'm going to walk us through some real kind of basic how to, what to do, and a little bit of what not to do in terms of how to talk to children about war, about conflict, how to enable them to bring to you and to digest and process whatever it is that is stirred for them by what they're hearing and seeing on the news. And we will end briefly, but really importantly, thinking about how you look after yourself. So what we know, and it's so easy to forget, is that if in order for us to regulate and contain distressed children as their supportive adults, we absolutely must look to how we are regulated and how we are supporting ourselves. So we're going to end um, with a, a brief think about that. Something that's often, I'd say often misunderstood is what we mean when we say trauma. So often when we talk about trauma, it refers to the event, the thing that happened, that is the trauma. Um, and actually, a helpful way to think about trauma is that it's not the, the event itself, but trauma is the imprint that it leaves on the child's nervous system. And of course, that's true for adults too. So um, a simple example would be 
Um, a parental divorce for one child would not be traumatic. For another child would be traumatic. The imprint on that child's nervous system is a traumatic imprint. And there's so many different factors which lead to whether an event is um, traumatic for a child or not. In thinking about the theme of war and conflict, it's really important to tune into what are the lived experiences of this child? So if the child that you have in mind has had previous experiences of uh, loss, of bereavement, of injury, of any scenario, situation where they have experienced fear, uncertainty, unpredictability, then the likelihood is their trauma memories are frozen in their nervous system. Really, this is the heart of child trauma. So trauma memories get frozen in time in their nervous system. And so when they see and hear news about war and conflict, what can happen is their trauma memories literally get reawakened and they can re-experience their own trauma symptoms, their own trauma reactions, as if the thing that's happening out there, somewhere else in the world, is happening right now to them. So when we think through our ideas um, today about how to talk to children, this applies to all children, and particularly children who may have their own trauma memories reawakened. So how do we see and spot distress? There are, broadly speaking, two types of distress that can be triggered, activated by um, a direct trauma or by being exposed to trauma in other people, which is what we have when we think about this theme. And one of the types of reactions is hyperarousal. So the hyperarousal means when the child's nervous system has high levels of arousal. So when a child is hyper aroused, we tend to see things that become, if you like, they become present. Um, behaviors and emotional expressions um, start to change. And we might see the child being visibly anxious, being anxious about separating from key adults, we might see them moving into being irritable, angry, restless, perhaps sleep becomes a problem. It may become a bit fighty, argumentative, and it might be hard for them to learn and to process information. Now, this isn't an, um, an all-inclusive list. There are many other ways that hyper arousal can show up for children. Um, this gives you a sense of things that can start to show up for children that, that wasn't there before. So that's hyper arousal. In many ways, hyper arousal is much easier to spot. And what can sometimes go under the radar is hypo arousal. So hypo arousal is when a child's nervous system drops, their arousal levels drop right down into a dissociative um, kind of shutdown mode. So for children in hyperarousal, you may see their mood drop, they may become quiet and withdrawn, um, numb. These children may be sleeping a lot more than usual, perhaps not eating. And again, struggling to learn. It's very hard to process information when you're shut down. And often what we see, it's rarely one or the other. We often see children move between hyper and hypo arousal, move between the two. So the heart of this is if you see a change in the child's behavior, then this is a clue that there's something that's going on. And if they've got experiences of trauma already, then the, the likelihood is that something is being stirred. And really keep an eye out for the children who go into hypoarousal, who often slip under the radar. Um, these are the children that, that don't often get picked up because their distress is very quiet. So let's get practical. 
how to help. One of the things that we can do as very well-meaning, loving adults is to reassure children when they seem distressed. So we might be inclined to say things like, don't worry, it's absolutely fine. It's nothing to worry about. Or we might say, don't be silly. It's not that bad. It's fine. So our intention is to make the child feel better. Actually, the impact when there is a real, quite frightening thing happening out there in the world, the impact of reassurance can be invalidating because the child is full of emotions, full of body responses. And if we say, oh, don't worry, it's fine. What we're saying is, yeah, your feelings aren't, uh, they're not valid. You, you shouldn't be feeling those feelings. So paradoxically, through reassurance, we might be unhelpful and uncontaining. So what's the opposite? The opposite is to validate. And this is actually really simple to do. So simple sentences like, yeah, I'm really not surprised that you feel scared or worried or confused. You know, so do I. There's many days when I watch the news and I also feel sad. Or you might say it's so common. There's so many children at the moment who feel the same way that you do. And it's tough, isn't it? It's so tough having all of these feelings and not being able to do anything about the situation. So simple validation goes a long way to just regulating the child's nervous system. Another thing we might be inclined to do in, as part of our reassurance is to, um, to not be honest. And it's always with the intention of protecting the child. But what children need from us is honesty. So if they ask a question, they need us to answer the question as honestly as we can, bearing in mind two things. One, what we know, because if we don't know, then it's okay for us to say to them, do you know, I just don't know. I just don't know the answer to that. It's tough not knowing, isn't it? So one, do we know the answer? And two, um, how old are they and what information is going to be appropriate? So if you have, for example, siblings in a household, what you share with a seven-year-old is going to be different to what you share with a 15-year-old. But I encourage everybody to make a, a real commitment to being as honest and as informed as you can be. It's regulating and containing for children rather than anxiety provoking. I think this is one of the toughest things actually for, um, for adults supporting children is thinking about how we can limit the child's exposure. Um, what we are all so aware of is the impact of social media and what we know is that children are seeing really graphic images and videos um, often um, images and videos and information that is very hard for us as as adults to um, to control and, and to monitor so do what you can to limit their exposure and where possible See if you can share information with children through conversation with you. If you find information that you feel would be appropriate for your child, be proactive and bring that information to them so that at the very least what they have is a balance of information coming from different sources. It can be really helpful to have pretty direct conversations with children, particularly older children, teenagers, about what do they know? So really have those curious questions with, with the child. So what, what do you know? What have you seen? Um, what have you heard? What are your friends talking about? And another important conversation is exploring with them. So where did you get that information from? or which website or which um, social media platform. Um, and most children wouldn't know anything about things like propaganda. 
and fake news. And it can be really um, helpful and important for young people to understand that what they see and hear on the news is not necessarily fact. So for the older teens, explaining to them the complexities of news can help them to start discerning and deciphering what information they want to seek out, what information they let in and what information they are perhaps sceptical about. Um, and you might want to do some fact checking with them if they bring some information to you about something that you think, hmm, I'm not sure that the um, validity of that, do some fact checking together and make it a, a proactive um, exploration of news and information. Be open and curious. So often we wait as adult supporting children we wait to see if they say anything first because we don't want to make things worse now you know for some children that's the right thing to do for many actually what they are looking to us for is a sign about is it safe to talk about this um is it safe to ask questions so an invitation to you all is to be proactive in your curiosity. So ask questions before your child brings their distress to you or before they ask you questions. Um, now, children often, depending on their age and their, their previous experiences, um, often find it really hard to find words for what they're feeling. So you might want to be curious about what's going on in their body. This is often a much easier way for children to um, connect with what's going on. So think, first of all, about how and where and when you have conversations. Children are much more able to um, have a free flowing conversation when you're doing something, when you're doing an activity. So have a think about when you're walking, when you're cooking, when you're driving. Um, often when there's not direct eye contact, children can feel freer in the conversation. So pick your moment, make it kind of spontaneous and um, comfortable. And then think about there's three ways you can come in when you're curious about how a child is. You can ask about their body, you can ask about their feelings, or you can ask about their thoughts. And as I said, starting with the body can be a really good way in. So for example, so when you watch the news, what do you notice you feel in your body? Or where do you feel it in your body? moving to emotions when you hear what your friends are talking about with the war um, going on in whichever country you're, you've got in your mind um, what feelings come up for you what words would you give them if your feelings had a color what color would they be if your feelings had a shape what shape would they be and then moving to thoughts you might be curious about what do you tell yourself when you hear what's going on in the news does it remind you of anything in your own life? That's, um, and does that play on your mind? Are you having dreams? Are you having thoughts that make you feel uncomfortable? So be curious and ask the direct questions and don't fear that you'll make things worse because the chances are they're already, it's already being stirred up within the child. Find the helpers. So often children watching the news and, and following um, information on social media, it feel they really feel the sense of helplessness and hopelessness and tragedy. And it can be so cathartic for children to be guided to find the helpers. So where are the emergency services? Where are the humanitarian pathways? Um, where are the peace talks? Where are the um, the people, you know, the locals doing everything they can to create a community around the people suffering? So seek out the helpers, find their stories, find their images, imagine with your child what it's like to be a helper in a war zone. And it can really connect them to the sense of hope and possibility and um, human community. 
that can be really containing for children. As we know only too well, war and conflict divides communities. So when you're talking to children, see if you can intentionally spread compassion and intentionally avoid stereotyping, stereotyping that we might often see and hear on the news. And remind the child that everyone, all children have a right to safety. All children have a right to life and dignity. And be really mindful about not feeding into some of the um, dividing um, and discriminative messages that your child will be hearing on the news. Connected to having a sense of hope and um, possibility, get active get engaged with positive action. So there's so many things that you can do with children, whether it's creating a petition or fundraising, making a poster, um, lighting a candle. There's so many different things that a child can do. And that sense of I am contributing something small to this terrible situation can feel really um, well, it's containing and regulating and gives the child a sense of purpose in what can often feel like a helpless and hopeless context. Do what you can to help them express themselves. So you'll know your child well in terms of what works for them. So think about creativity. Use writing, drawing, messy play play um, to express what's coming up for them think about distraction often we need to help children to titrate what's going on titrate means just put, make it into smaller chunks so it's tolerable so how can you help them to um, distract themselves away from exposure to um, what they're seeing on the news and um, and grounding so things like um, comforting smells, um, noticing what's happening around them in the here and now. Um, and I'll share some information about that just at the end of my talk. So lastly, thinking about safety. So think with your child about where their safety is. So who do you feel safe with? Where do you feel safe? Um, how can we connect more to the things in your own world that make you feel safe, including staying connected, staying connected to your important adults? So how can you use transitional objects that move between the child's different places, home and school, um, perhaps increase your contact, your texting, um, increase your physical contact, hugs, quality time together. So ramp up their experience of being connected to increase their sense of safety in the here and now. And then lastly, as I said at, at the start of my talk, you cannot support a child if you are yourself feeling stressed and dysregulated. So what do you need to be regulated? What do you need to be settled? Who can you reach out to? That's first and supporting the children around you comes second. So on our website, as David said at the start, we have lots and lots of resources. So please feel free to jump on our website, share the resources with families, with professionals. And we have a resource about how to talk to children about war, where everything that I've spoken about today is covered with a lot more detail. So please feel free to jump on there and see what you find there. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>